Uh, and well, well, we'll move along though to a, 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 a certain point before I, I give you that. All right. They came down, uh, Moses and, uh, and the children of Israel left the Red Sea and they progressed rather than go straight along the coast to the Jerusalem area, which would have been along this way. See the route to the land of the Philistines? All through that, that would just have been a straight way, as straight as you could go. But they didn't go that way. All right, they sent in spies up here, and they said, we can't do it. So they didn't have the heart to, to, uh, to do what God told them to do. So that was it. Now, they, they're uh, sentenced, more or less. You're going to wander in the wilderness uh, 40 years, and all of you who are over 20 years old when you came across this Red Sea, you're all going to die. Of course, uh, that's we, after we see the whole summation of it all, that's, that's what he could have said, because that's what happened. Because we see it reported later on. All of them died but two. All of you over 20 years old, you'll wander around through here for 40 years, and only two will cross this Jordan here. Let me bring this to your attention. They crossed this on dry land, the Red Sea, through a, a miraculous way. That's not the only time they crossed a body of water on dry land. Where was the other? After 40 years of wandering, they came to the Jordan River. And they had certain orders of marching. When the feet of the Levites who carried the the Ark of the Covenant, when their feet touched the water, the water dried up. They went across the Jordan River on dry land. South Alabama would tell you that's Jordan, I guess. They went across the Jordan River on uh, dry land. All right. Now, rather than go this way, as you can see, towards the Promised Land, they went down this way following pretty close to the large body of the Red Sea. And they came down here to this area. This is Mount Sinai here. Or there is another name for that mountain. What's the name of that? The other name? Horeb. Mount Horeb. H-O-R-E-B. Now this is where um, Moses had been tending sheep in this area because this is where Moses got his orders from God to go back up here and get his people and lead them out. This is where he uh, saw the burning bush and he said, that bush is on fire but it doesn't consume it. It's not consumed. And he went over and uh, he was confronted by God there and God gave him his orders. All right. Now, he's come back to this area, and you picture this crowd of people, uh, and if you read Numbers, you see they had an order of travel, and they had an order of uh, uh, putting their tents down all around the tabernacle when they stopped. They didn't travel all the time. They moved the distance and then stopped, and they had orders on how to build a tabernacle, and all these people uh, stayed in certain groups. you find that... Uh, they gathered themselves around the uh, tabernacle. So there would be two to three million people. We don't know how many, but we guessed two to three million people. Well, that's a lot of folks. Florida didn't have uh, more than a few hundred thousand by 1940, for instance. Florida's just gone wild with growth since the 1940s. Uh, but here's all this whole group of people wandering out through the desert. And their reputation is going ahead of them. They had already scared the, the Egyptians. And the Egyptians hated them, of course. And in the end, they uh, lost their army here. But this news travels around through this area. 
And if they had done what God told them to do, God would be their heavenly help, and they wouldn't have had problems. That is, problems that couldn't be surmounted. But now they're, they're out in the desert, and it's not like living in their homes over in here. So they've got some folks that grumble all the time, fuss and uh, moan and go on. And uh, they, they didn't like that, in that, that old dry climate. They didn't have enough water to drink. But here Moses is instructed to go up on Mount Sinai, right here, Mount Sinai. And there he received what we know as the what? The Ten Commandments. They are called the Decalogue. The Decalogue. Deca meaning ten. The Ten Commandments. The Decalogue. These Ten Commandments are the basis for all the law of Moses. This is the first written law. I understand I've been emphasizing this all along. The patriarchal dispensation, there was no written law. The mosaical dispensation, there was a written law. The Christian dispensation, there was a written law. Uh, and the basis of this written law is the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. There are 613 commands all total if you count them in uh, the Mosaic Law. A few more negative than there are positives. In other words, a few more do-nots than there are do's. Uh, you might uh, run on to people nowadays that said, well, uh, who says, well, I don't think you ought to have a preacher that preaches negative all the time. Well, God gave a law in the Old Testament of uh, do's and don'ts, 1600, 613 of them, and uh, there was more don'ts than there was do's. That's more negatives than positives. But uh, man still grumbles. Man still has problems. All right, Moses was up on this mountain 40 days. Do you notice how many 40s there are and we run into? The rain, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, and Moses' life divided into three 40s, and they wandered in the wilderness 40 years, and just every time you run on something, it's 40 this or 40 that. He stayed on this mountain 40 days, and God, he was in the presence of God, but the Bible says no man has seen God face to face. But he was in the presence of God, and God wrote the Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone. He carried them down that mountain after the 40 days, and he saw at the base of mountain what? A what? Golden That's right, a golden calf. But more than that, what he saw, if you want to be quite crude about it, would have been what we call an orgy nowadays. Uh, remember that... Uh, these, these folks had come from an area over here. That they worshipped anything they thought looked good or felt good to them, if you please. Now, we call that type of religion or that type of philosophy nowadays existentialism. The uh, hippies in the late 1960s, such as our beloved or non-beloved president, uh, I think was part of that movement, uh, their philosophy was make love, not war. Uh, if it feels good to you, do it. No man is your boss. You are a law unto yourself. All right, any time that any society slips into that type of uh, an attitude, we could very well have what we call existentialism. Paul ran into it in, uh, in the Mediterranean area where those people did not know of the true God, so therefore everybody had a God. And they just did a little of everything. There's where he, for instance, at Corinth, encountered religious whores in temples and things like that. Well, everything that goes around comes around, you might say. There's nothing new on this earth. So some of the things that we see done today, it's, they don't, we don't have anything on what was going on in places back in there. These Egyptians, uh, it is figured that they were not only worshiping the golden calf, but they were going into some of their, uh, their beliefs on sex and everything else back over in there, according to history. All right. He came down from that, uh, that mountain, and he saw they were worshiping the golden calf, just having a big time. And uh, 
This is an example of a hard-headed bunch. What had happened? What made them do that? They said, Moses gone, and they'd gone up on the mountain for all these days, and we don't know whether he's even going to come back or not. What are we going to do? He had been directing their worship and so on, and they took their gold trinkets. You remember all these Egyptians gave them little trinkets of gold and everything else that they could get to give them to get, it, get them out of there? And uh, they gathered them up and fashioned a gold calf. Aaron, I believe, said Aaron fashioned the gold calf. Now, Aaron is the spiritual leader while Moses is gone up on the mountain. Aaron is the background of the Aaronic priesthood. But he's being swept up in the, in, in the whole deal here. And uh, Moses asked, what is this? Or, what, what are you worshiping here? And uh, Aaron didn't exactly say it right, but they were afraid. And Moses got so angry that he threw the stones down and broke them. And then he had them grind the calf up, uh, the golden calf up, and throw it in the water, and then they were to drink the water. Uh, so it's really whipping the people, if you please giving them a good spanking, but that's not all. How many people died on that day? The wrath of God came upon them, and they were killed, slain. God killed a bunch of them or caused them to be killed. Do you remember? If you don't, don't uh, look over there. Uh, it would be after the, uh, the 20th chapter of Exodus. When he came down from the mountain, <clears throat> all right, has anybody found it yet? 3,000 or 23,000? 3, 3,000. Oh, how, how many? Read, read, where are you? 3228. 3228. 3228. Read it if you will. All right. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, there's how many died there. So you see the purge beginning. A bunch of hard-headed people that wouldn't obey God and wouldn't stay faithful for 40 days. All right, Moses went back up on the mountain and again stayed how long? 40 days. And he received the Ten Commandments again. Now we know that, uh, that he... Uh, received all of the 613 commandments because you found them later in these uh, uh, books, early books of the Bible, Leviticus and so on. But just going through in an overview now, I realize that he received all of these uh, commands. All right, they went back now and they got started. They were led in the daytime by what? When something moved, they moved. When the cloud overhead moved in the daytime, they moved. If they moved at night, they were guided by a pillow of fire. All right, so there's more evidence of uh, the uh, miraculous leading by God through all of this wilderness area. Now, they complained one time because they didn't have enough uh, meat. God had told them that if they were hungry, he would feed them by, what was the name of this food? Manna. Manna. Manna from heaven. It's supposed to be something like, uh, some people think it might have been something like oatmeal or something of that nature. But nevertheless, they could go out and gather it. And they were to gather how much? Just enough for the day. Just enough for the day. You know what the... Uh, 
Lord's Prayer, we call a Lord's Prayer. It's really the model prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. That's what we should pray for. All right. Then when it came to the day before the Sabbath, they were together. How much? Enough for the Sabbath and that day too. So that they wouldn't work on the Sabbath. So you see, some of their, their rules respected the Lord God, of course, in, in that respect. And uh, they, they complained later on, well, they didn't like all that, that manna. Evidently, that was, well, you make me eat mush all the time or something like that. You make me eat manna. And uh, we'd sure like to have some of the, uh, the flesh that we used to cook down in uh, Egypt. So God did what? He sent a bunch of quail. I don't know whether they had to use special methods to trap them or kill them or whatnot, but he must have sent a bunch of them because that was all the food they wanted. You know that if you go into some of the finest restaurants in the United States today, the most tasty meal that you'll get in the way of flesh will be quail. It's expensive, too, because it takes some problem to raise them, you know, and, uh, uh, and they are a tasty bird. Uh, one whole meal it always consists of one pretty big fat quail for any, any person where you serve those. Uh, all right, so there he took care of their special needs. They went further, and they, uh, in that dry area, they always wanted more water, and at one time, God fed them with, uh, with uh, special uh, miracle water. And then at another time, as we mentioned last Wednesday, there's a chapter in the Bible, Numbers 20, which I told you to remember, which shows why Moses did not get into the land of promise. And there these people were complaining, and they wanted water, and uh, Moses got angry at them. So if you'll turn to... Uh, Numbers 20. Let's read together here. This is what I want to show you about some of the, uh, the aggravation that Moses went through. We'll start at the first of the uh, chapter, the 20th chapter. And the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam uh, died there and was buried there. That's Moses' sister. And there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And I see they're, they're the leaders. It's your fault, they're saying. And the people strove with Moses and spake, saying, Would that we had died when our brethren died before Jehovah. It had been good if we had just died back there at Mount Sinai. And why have ye brought the assembly of Jehovah into this wilderness that we should die there, we and our beasts. And wherefore hath ye made us to come up out of Egypt? Why'd you get us out of there to start with? We, we didn't really not like that place, to bring us into this evil place. We're out here in the desert where we, didn't, we can't find water to drink, we can't find anything to eat much. It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. You can't grow a garden here for anything, they would might say. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of tent and meeting and fell upon their faces, and the glory of Jehovah appeared unto them. And Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod and assemble the congregation, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, that it bring forth its water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their cattle drink. And Moses took the rod from before Jehovah as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, you know, well, you bunch of hard necks, shall we bring forth water out of the rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and smote the rock with a rod twice. And water came forth abundantly. And the congregation drank and their cattle. See, he disobeyed God there. If I asked on the question, uh, why did Moses not enter the promised land? One word will suffice. Disobedience. 
And Jehovah said unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believe not in me to sanctify me or to set me apart in the eyes of the children of Israel. In other words, he, he didn't give God the praise that he should. Therefore ye shall not bring the assembly into the land which I have given them. You won't bring them in. Moses, I had you to go over to Egypt and bring them out, but you won't bring them in. These are the waters of Mirabah, because the children of Israel strove with Jehovah, and he was sanctified in them. There's the reason why even the leader did not go in. The future leader did. Joshua became the leader of the, uh, of the uh, Israelites who conquered that land. Now, let's back up a little bit further, and I'll give you an example of, uh, of some of the complaining that these folks did. They complained against God's chosen ruler. If God sets out a plan, and he uses people. For instance, he's, he's given us a, a plan and a system for setting up the church. There's elders, there's deacons, there's preachers, and so on. And we see, well, somebody will come along nowadays and say, well, you don't need elders. Really, that, they're nothing. All you've got to do is just uh, uh, make your decisions for yourself. Or you don't even really need to uh, come to services. God didn't look at that, that way under the rule of Moses. He had chosen Moses to be his leader. And he didn't, let's say he wouldn't take any back talk from the crowds. Let's go back to the 16th chapter of Numbers. And look at this man, Korah and uh, Dathan and Abiram. Now Korah, the son of Ezhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, see, they're, they're from a priestly tribe, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben, now he's not of the uh, Levitical tribe, took men. Now here's the leaders, Korah and Dathan. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the congregation, called to the assembly men of renown. And they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy. In other words, we don't think that you ought to be the leader. You're, you're just getting too big for your britches. Now God's appointed Moses, I understand that, but... Look what they're doing. They're rebelling against God's commands. Ye take too much upon you, serving all the congregation, are, uh, seeing all the congregation are holy. We're all holy. We're just like you. So, so you shouldn't be taking all this responsibility. Every one of them, and Jehovah is among them. Whereof, wherefore then lift ye up yourselves among the assembly of Jehovah. So they're trying to get at Moses that way. You're too high and mighty. Why did you lift yourself up like this? And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face, and he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, In the morning Jehovah will show who are his. You know, we'll just put up a test. In the morning God will tell us who's his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even when uh, him whom he shall choose will he cause to come near unto him. This do, Moses tell them now, you do this. Take you censers. That would be a stick with some fire and so on on it. Uh, that which would uh, you could light. Take you censers, Korah, and all his company, and put fire on them, and put incense upon them before Jehovah. This is sweet-smelling herbs and so on. Tomorrow, and it shall be that the man whom Jehovah doth choose, all right, in the morning, we, you know, we want you to do this, and, the man that Jehovah does choose, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. And Moses said unto Korah, Hear now, ye sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of Jehovah and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. Look here, Korah. You're already of the tribe of Levi. The Levites are to take care of the, of the uh, uh, religious affairs of all this group of people, two to, three to mil two to three million people. 
And you think it's a small matter? God's already set you folks out in a special way. And now you're complaining about this? And that he hath brought thee near, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also? See, some of them made priests. Therefore thou and all thy company are gathered together against Jehovah and Aaron. What is he that ye murmur against him? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and they said, We will not come up. In other words, go get those other two. Bring them up. And they said, No, we're not going to go. It is a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey. In other words, they left Egypt. They liked it down there, they said, to kill us in the wilderness, and thou must needs make thyself also a prince over us. You brought us out here in the desert where there's nothing but snakes and scorpions and, <clears throat> and no water, and we're burning up out here in this old desert, and who made you a prince over us? In other words, they're fussing about the fact that Moses is their leader. I want you to see what God does to people who fuss about things like this and rebel against his commands. Moreover, thou hast not brought us unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Of course, you had not got there yet. Nor given inheritance of fields and, and vineyards. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. In other words, what you want to come up there for? You want to stick them up, punch your eyes out? And Moses was very wroth. In other words, made him mad. God said Moses was a meek man, but that didn't mean he didn't get angry. And said unto Jehovah, now Moses saying this to God, Respect not thou their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. I hadn't taken one donkey. Now I hadn't hurt any of them, but they're all fussing against me. And Moses said unto Korah, be thou and all thy company before Jehovah, thou and they and Aaron, tomorrow. You come up here tomorrow. And take ye every man his censer, and put incense upon them, and bring ye before Jehovah every man in his censer, 250 censers, thou also and Aaron, each his censer. And they took every man his censer, and put fire on them, and laid incense thereon, and stood at the door of the tent of meeting, that would have been the tabernacle, with Moses and Aaron, and Korah assembled all the congregation against them under the door of the tent of meeting, and the glory of Jehovah appeared unto all the congregation. And Jehovah spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves. Moses, you and Aaron, just get away from all this bunch. I'm going to kill them all. Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. Now, you think that God wasn't about ready to do something there? He was. Moses prayed for their existence. And they fell upon their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and wilt thou be wor uh, wroth with all the congregation? In other words, this Korah is causing all this. You're going you're gonna to destroy us all? And uh, Jehovah uh, said unto Moses, or spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Get away from these, these rebels here. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. So they get them up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of the tents, and their wives and their sons and their little ones. And Moses said, Hereby, now here's the test. Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that Jehovah hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of, of my own mind. If these men die a normal death, if these men die the common death of all men, if they die of old age, then I'm wrong. But he wasn't wrong, of course. These men die a common death of all men, or if they be visited with the visitation of all men, then Jehovah hath not sent me, and I'm not, in, it's, I'm not your leader. But they're not going to die that way, understand that way. But if Jehovah make a new thing, and the ground open its mouth, and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down alive into Sheol to the grave, then ye shall understand that these men have despised Jehovah. And that's exactly what happened. It came past as he made the end of speaking these words that the ground clave asunder, it opened up and uh, that was under them and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up and their household and all the men that appertained unto Korah and their, their goods. Alright, you could go ahead and read further on that. But if you want to see 
a rebellion of a people and the fact that it aggravated God to the point that he was willing to make a great nation of uh, Moses and uh, his brother, that's the place to go to. God wouldn't tolerate that sort of thing in those days. He does not tolerate it today in New Testament times when men make sport of that which he commands. That's very important to study in this Old Testament. We can understand then how important it is to do God's will nowadays and to follow his commands. All right. After the 40 years in the, in the, one, of the wildering, wandering wilderness, in the wilderness wandering, uh, you see, this is the track they took all around in here, just wandering around and around. Now, in recent years, Israel uh, had all of this land over in here. They took it from the Egyptians, but the Egyptians didn't care that much about it. They gave it back to them a couple of years ago in a peace treaty. In the War of 18, 1967, they ran the Egyptians all the way back across the Suez Canal and just, I guess, grinned at them across the canal. But uh, as I said, this is desert. There's nothing to own much in there. But they do, that uh, land of Israel over there now has a little strip of land. It comes out right down in here. They've got a little old seaport down here. and comes right back up here, a narrow strip of land. But this, they probably got a road down through that. That's about all. So they were wandering around through desert that wasn't worth anything. Uh, nothing but, uh, I'd say, scorpions and snakes and whatever can live under a rock and, and uh, keep cool in the daytime and get out at night. Uh, they came finally back up this way, and they came on this side of the Dead Sea. Now you say, well, this is part of the promised land. It really was. But it seems that for purposes of, uh, of defining in the Bible when they really crossed over, it's when they crossed the Jordan River. Now, Moses was taken up on a mountain, and uh, he was shown he could look across and see. There is a term called Mount Pisgah. Pisgah, right there it is, from the plains of Moab. But uh, there was a particular mount on that group of mountains called what? Where did Moses die? Nebo. N-E-B-O, Mount Nebo. All right. Moses was 120 years old. He had led his people well. He had put up with all sorts of complaints and problems. One time, for instance, uh, they even complained about, it said, the wife that Moses had. Now, there's two theories of that. One is that, uh, that they were talking about his original wife, uh, Zipporah, and I say original because we don't know for sure if she had uh, died and he married another or if he had married another because it was from the south. Of, uh, and some people believe, well, she was from uh, the African continent, therefore black. And they were complaining of his race hatred, in other words, that, that woman you've got. Well, uh, this was before Miriam died because what happened? God punished Miriam, didn't Miriam and, and Aaron? They were, they were complaining about that woman Moses had married. And uh, she became leprous, and Moses prayed for her, and, and God restored her. But see, they, all of them complained, it seemed, one time or the other, and against Moses. What a job he had, 40 years leading that bunch of hardheads. And now they come up here, and they're ready to go across.